w one of the problems associated with this particular situation, of course, is that we have a kind of a growing public dissatisfaction in many, many parts of the world because governments, since they don't, since they cannot solve uh, global problems, um, are, are not able to deliver to their peoples, you know, what, 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 what they want and what they would expect. Um, and, and so this is leading many experts to say that we are actually moving very quickly into a, a kind of a crisis of governance, you know. We live in a world in which nobody's in charge, in which these global problems are there, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, they pose risks for the, for the future of humanity. They are going to affect our welfare as individuals, as citizens, you know, in our respective countries in very important ways, and yet nothing is being done, right? Major planetary issues are being neglected. Um, we're failing massively um, and risking being overwhelmed by a whole range of problems, um, the solutions to which require much stronger mechanisms of international cooperation, right? And so perhaps, you know, I can just mention quickly in passing what are some of these global problems? And, and you can, you know, you, 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 I'm sure you will identify with them. I don't want to go into details because, because you, 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 you are familiar with them. I've already referred to global warming. Um, there is a whole question of what's happening with the tropical forests. Um, uh, there's a great deal of deforestation in the world taking place. There is biodiversity loss. I'm not a biologist, but I do read, uh, uh, you know the the sort of the, the, the latest thinking on what's happening on the on, on, on the on the uh, biodiversity side, and, and and it's very very concerning. We are uh, the rates of extinction of species, whether it's plants or animals, you know, is accelerating at, at great speed in, in, in the last few decades. Uh, there is an issue of fisheries, depletion of fisheries. Um, there is the whole, of course, question of income disparities. We could, we could say a great deal about income disparities, but it is a source of concern. Levels of inequality today are much, much higher than they have been at any period, period in, the, in the history of, of, of mankind, at least as long as we have data, which is a couple of hundred years. Um, people are saying, you know, um, actually, we shouldn't worry too much about inequality because already the poor countries are growing more quickly than the rich countries, which is true. If you actually look at the data, the very poor countries for the last 20 years have been growing at twice the rate of the rich countries. And so some uh, uh, optimistic economists are saying, look, we've, got, we've solved the problem of income disparity because eventually the poor countries will catch up. Uh, if they are growing at twice the rate of the rich countries, arithmetically it is true that eventually they will catch up. But then when you actually begin to do the analysis, which we have done at the World Bank, you begin to see that, say, see that this catching up process will take a very, very, very long time. It's not any time soon, right? Because the gap is so huge between the income level of the poor countries and the income level of the high income countries that it takes you know, many, many, many decades before any catch-up takes place. And the question is, what happens in the meantime? In the meantime, you have these income disparities which are actually widening. Um, we have the whole issue of the global financial architecture. Um, you are, I, I see in the audience a lot of young people, and probably you, you don't have very good memories of the Asian financial crisis, which, as I remember, began in Thailand in 1997 and then spread to other parts of, the, of, this, of, the, of East Asia and the Pacific, and then went to Russia, and then went to Turkey, and then you know, became a pretty global phenomenon. But, but you know, we don't have a kind of a very intelligent way of dealing with global financial crisis. Uh, what we have is a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, sort of overnight um, uh, 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 sort of innovation, uh, uh, sometimes inspired, some not, sometimes not so inspired, and what we have is a lot of costs associated with financial crisis, as happened in 2008 and 2009, of course. There is a whole question of illegal drugs, there is a question of terrorism, there is a question of um, education. You know, we have 800 million people in the world who are illiterate, can't read and write. Uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, 800 million people, you know, in the 21st century, uh, at a time when income levels are, as, are higher than at any time in the, in the, in the, in the past, 
We have countries that are spending money subsidizing gasoline consumption and, and not educating, you know, sort of uh, young people, uh, uh, especially women, you know, who can't read and write, who therefore don't have the most important tool that is going to take them out of, of poverty. Um, and so on. So, so basically, um, what is happening is that um, the world is under stress. The world is is facing looming crisis over over the next uh, few years and and and, uh, and decades, and um, we don't seem to have the appropriate mechanisms of international cooperation that are actually going to allow us to solve these, these problems. And in fact, this raises the question, you know, what are some of the mechanisms of international cooperation that we have? And, and why is it that they're not working? And, and perhaps I can just review very briefly for you for a few minutes, you know, some of these mechanisms. Um, one of them is, you know, we have treaties and conventions that in the past, you know, very often that has been the way in which we have a dealt with a, 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 a problem. Uh, one recent example of this was the so-called Kyoto Protocol, right? You remember the Kyoto Protocol. Um, it was ne negotiated in, in 1997. It uh, was ratified uh, in 2005. And, and then basically, uh, did we fulfill by 2015 the commitments that were made in the Kyoto Protocol, not at all. You know, for, although back in 1997 it was seen as a as a kind of a very good example of international cooperation on the issue of climate change, uh, when you actually look at what was achieved by 2015, nothing was achieved. Uh, the targets were not met. Global emissions were much higher than than had uh, anticipated. So, from that perspective, it was a complete failure. Um, um, other UN treaties, um, like there is one treaty called uh, a treaty on machine uh, marine marine fish management. Um, it went into force in December of 2001, uh, but only 15 of the 20 top fishing uh, nations had uh, actually 15 of the top 20 fishing nations had not ratified the 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 the, 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 the treaty. Uh, the problem with these treaties is that there is very lax enforcement. Uh, if you don't abide by the commitments that you make in the treaty, uh, nothing happens, essentially, as, what, as happened with, with Kyoto Protocol, of course, right? And so it's not a very effective way to solve a problem, right? It's good that countries come together, they recognize there is a common problem, that they face a, a, a particular challenge. But in terms of actual results, you know, it doesn't really work. It doesn't, it doesn't really solve the problem that we have at hand. You know? There are all kinds of intergovernmental conferences. Um, uh, we had a, a conference in Rio in 1992 on the environment, if you, re if you remember. And then uh, 20 years later, there was a repeat conference also in Rio in 2012. And what was the theme of the 2012 conference? Basically. It was a, a kind of a lamenting how 20 years later we hadn't really done anything that we had agreed that we would do in 1992, right? Which is not a very, not, not a very good message. We had have had under the auspices of the United Nations all kinds of other intergovernmental conferences. We had uh, the so-called social summit in Copenhagen in 1995. There was a, a conference on population in in Cairo. I mean, you know, there are. These, these initiatives, you know, they're good in terms of raising awareness about, about you know, problems, looming problems, but they're not good for, for problem solving, right? Um, other ways in which we collaborate, you know, we have, of course, the various G groupings, right? We have the G7 for many, many years, the, G, the most important uh, seven largest economies of the world coming together twice a year to discuss issues of economic significance for the future of the planet. Um, it was then seen as being a rich country club and, 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 and it, it was not seen as being particularly representative. So sometime in the late 1990s, um, we, um, we created the G20, which then brought in China and India and Russia and Brazil and you know, other bigger economies. And of course, the G20 is much more representative but the problem with these groupings is that, is that 
first of all, they just bring governments together, right? They bring public, and public servants, you know, to come together to discuss issues. The civil society does not participate. Uh, the business community is not represented. Um, and, and of course, you could ask, well, why G20? Why not G22? Or why not G25? You know, why is it that some countries are represented and others aren't? So we still have the issue of legitimacy, political legitimacy. To what extent does the G20 actually speak for, for humanity? Uh, it is more representative than the G7, but, but, but you know, it, uh, it's not a truly, truly universal representation of, of mankind. And, and of course, very often these, these meetings are a little bit, um, uh, what's the word, um, um, you know, not very much focused on finding solutions to problems. Um, uh, you know, the G7, they used to, they used to negotiate the communique for the, for the G7 meeting before the meeting actually took place, right? And so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an, a, a meeting where, you know, uh, there would be a lot of consultation and problem solving. You know? um, the, the conference in Bretton Woods in 1944 was one such gathering. Uh, 44 countries came together and during seven weeks they consulted and eventually out of that meeting they created a new global financial system. That is the kind of consultation that we need that is the kind of decision making that we need you know, to address some of these global problems, but that, that we don't have at the moment. There are other ways in which we collaborate. We have global institutions, you know, like the multilateral organizations, like the IMF, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, and so on. These are important organizations. They are repositories of knowledge and experience, but you know, they have limited jurisdiction. Sometimes they are a little bit politicized uh, by their larger shareholders, and, and, and so on. Uh, one question that is increasingly being raised in some circles, you know, is, well, what about, what about a world government? Right? I mean, if we have common global problems which require global solutions and require levels of international cooperation at a much higher level of integration and coordination, then shouldn't, isn't the solution to this, to this, to this situ to situation, you know, to create a, a, some kind of global, global governance machinery, a global, a world government. And, you know, sort of some of the most forward-looking, forward-thinking political scientists are, are, are beginning to think about that, but the consensus seems to be that this is not something for the next 20 years. This is not something that is politically realistic that, that one could expect will emerge in the next 20, 25 years, essentially because we're not ready for it, kind of politically. Right? We're still too much identified with the, with the system of sovereign states, uh, where you know, there is national sovereignty, and, and, then, and then basically there is a vacuum uh, you know, in, in front of these global, political, uh, global, global systemic problems like climate change. And so, and so if, you, if you believe that world government is not a realistic possibility for the next few decades uh, uh, because we're not ready psychologically for it and we're not ready politically for it, uh, then, then it's really not an option, right? Because the problems that we have are problems today. Climate change is a problem for today, it's a problem for tomorrow. The, the, the ice is melting as we speak. Uh, millions of liters of war water are pouring into the ocean and are going to rise sea levels you know, in a significant way in coming years, right? And therefore, to basically say, well, we're going to wait until we create a world government that will actually have jurisdiction over, over emissions and will actually force governments you know, to, 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 cut, to make cutbacks, it's not, it's not a realistic option, right? So, so that's, that's a, a bit of a problem. Although, longer term, it's a very promising a very promising solution. And, and you might say, but no, I mean, world government is never going to happen because, because we're never going to be ready for it. But look, uh, there is already something called the European Union, which is a bit of a, it's very much a supranational uh, form of governance. The European Union brings together 28 countries. They have a European Parliament. They have a, many of them have a common currency. There is a body of European Union law. Uh, there is a European Court of Justice. There is a European Parliament that actually has jurisdiction over a whole range of areas within the member countries. So 
you cannot say that uh, having a machinery of supranational governance is unrealistic or will never happen because in fact we already have one such machinery in, within the European Union. Now of course it's got problems, there's no question about that. Um, uh, it is challenging to have 28 countries give up sovereignty and to work together uh, because we're coming out of centuries of, of national sovereignty where, where defense of the national interest was the most important thing. But these 28 countries are actually recognizing that no, there is something more important than the national interest, which is the common interest, the interest of you know, the collectivity, all 28 countries. So this is, this is kind of an interesting, interesting prospect for the future, but, but I, I myself think that perhaps it's not, it's, not, um, it's not something that will happen in the, next, uh, in the next couple of decades. And therefore, if world government is not an option, then what? Right? Where does that leave us at the moment? And this is where I will, I will get a little bit more speculative to, to bring, to come together to, 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 to sort of to wrap up my, my comments. And, and then I, I will invite you to, to ask questions, if, 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 if any. Um, you know that um, in addition to being an economist and uh, 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 a um, um, you know a sort of a, a somebody who's been working in the area of economic development um, in, a, in a kind of a private capacity I also happen to be a member of the Baha'i community uh, and as a Baha'i already for much of my adult life and my, my, my formative my formative years I have strongly believed in this this ideal uh, which was enunciated by the founder of the Baha'i Faith in the 19th century, which said, the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. And you know, as I was growing up, um, uh, I always thought of this as, as a being a very sort of a beautiful statement of some very noble principle, you know, something to do with kind of the brotherhood of, 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 of man, our, our common humanity, right? The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. I, I thought this is, you know, such a noble idea, you know, that we should actually all see ourselves as citizens of one common fatherland or motherland, uh, that we should see ourselves as flowers of one common garden and, and so on, you know? But it turns out, it turns out that it also is a scientifically true statement um, and let me explain, let me explain, and, and I need to go back a few years to the year 2000. I don't know whether you remember, I mean some of you were probably still very young at that time, uh, I see very young faces in the audience, but in the year 2000 I was unfortunately already a full grown adult, right? And I remember that there was this race between two teams, two, two, two teams of scientists, one in the United States, one in the United Kingdom, to complete the mapping of the human genome. And, uh, and eventually, uh, President Clinton in the United States and Prime Minister Blair in, in, in London uh, decided that they were going to call these, this a tie. You know, these two teams have been working uh, a bit independently of each other. And then uh, the, 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 these two politicians decided that we're going to say that they, you know, they have both jointly concluded the mapping of the human genome. And so they announced this. And this was seen as a very important, important uh, you know, scientific achievement uh, that would have you know, all kinds of repercussions in the future for our ability to treat illnesses and, and, and to begin to make kind of a genetic engineering in ways that would enhance the quality of life for, for, for many, many people. Uh, now, the, the scientist who led the American team um, was uh, somebody by the name of Craig Ventier, Professor Ventier. And he, one of the things that he said um, uh, uh, soon after the, the, the conclusion of this scientific research program, he said that we, that is the, the scientists on his team, were very interested in, uh, in understanding better the concept of race. Um, 
does race have a scientific, scientific underpinning? Is, is race something that you can actually explain in terms of uh, genes and people's genetic, uh, you know, uh, sort of infrastructure? And he said that what we discovered was really quite stunning. It was, it was very shocking. Because what, what we did is we looked at, 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 uh, at two individuals of very different racial groups. You can think of a Swede with blonde hair and blue eyes and white skin, and you can think of a black uh, sub-Saharan African with very dark skin and you know, very different facial features and curly hair and so on and so forth. And, and we asked ourselves, what percent of the genes do we need to explain these racial differences between these two very different people uh, who we think of as being from two different racial groups. And he said that we were shocked to discover that you only needed 0.01% uh, of the genes, uh, which at that time people w w were thought to, to be about 30,000, but although there is more now because you know, science has moved on. But you know, they said we only need about 0.01%. In other words, the genetic, genetic makeup of these two individuals is 99.99% identical. They have the same genes, right? And so he said, this led us to believe that um, race is not a scientific concept. Race is a cultural concept. There is only one race, the human race. And that was the conclusion from that particular scientific, scientific uh, research. There is only one race, the human race, which then brought me back to what I used to believe as a young Baha'i in my, in my early years, and, and I still believe today, you know, the earth is what one country and mankind is citizens. In other words, we're living in a world in which actually, you know, we need to, we need to make a kind of a conscious jump and to see ourselves not as French, not as Argentinians, not as Americans, not as uh, Thais, but we need to see ourselves as members of the human race, as members of the human family. Of course, there is diversity. Uh, this is expressed through our different physical appearances, our different cultures, our different eating habits, our different languages, uh, our different uh, religious affiliations, and so on. But beyond these differences, you know, there is something that is you know, common to all, which is basically that we are all members of the same human race. And I think that this kind of thinking has to be central as we look into the future and as we ask ourselves, you know, how are we going to confront the global challenges that we face? How are we going to move you know, to a, a world in which we actually find solutions to these, to these problems? Right? And so to conclude, you know, there are two scenarios. Right? One, is, one is the most desirable scenario, which is basically that we're going to be wise, we're going to be thoughtful, we're going to be mature, our leaders are going to, are going to uh, act in a, in a way that will be collaborative and, and, and uh, we're going to confront these global challenges and we're going to devise you know, creative, innovative solutions to these, to these problems. You know, as we did in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference in dealing with the global financial system, which was no longer working, right? And so that's one possible scenario. You know, it's, it's co cooperative. It is, it is, it is in, in a sense, it was the best, the, the best possible scenario because it brings together the best in human beings, the best in our political leaders, the best in our business community, the best in us as members of civil society, you know, to basically come together and say, look, we have serious problems. We need to work together to address these problems, right? Now, you may think that that's likely. I don't think I'm a cynic myself. I don't like cynicism. Um, but I also like to be realistic. And I like to be, I like to be, uh, you know, I like to keep my eyes open. And I think that this particular scenario of gradual collaborative uh, maturity uh, and us confronting problems, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, sort of a deliberate, thoughtful, consultative sort of way is not likely. I don't think it is likely. Uh, I think it, will, it, it, will, it would take a long time for us to develop that kind of maturity. 
And, and I think that in the meantime, many of these problems are going to overwhelm us. And so I don't think that, that, uh, that I would put my hopes on that particular very optimistic scenario you know, for the next couple of decades. Therefore, a more realistic scenario is a more troublesome scenario where essentially what we're going to see over the next you know, 20, 30 years is crises which, which reinforce and interact with each other. You know, the cl climate change will interact with the economy, with the financial system. Uh, there are a whole range of security issues which are, which are not being addressed in a very satisfactory way all over the world. There's a whole question of nuclear proliferation and, and so on. And so one, one alternative scenario is that these things would interact and, and that we're going to be facing crises, you know, um, which are going to be local, they're going to be national, they're going to be international, and that they will begin to sensitize humanity, they will sensitize you and me and people in the streets in, in Bangkok and in Buenos Aires and in Paris and in Sydney and in other parts of the world, including the developing world, of course, they will sensitize ourselves the business community, civil society, even our public servants who are working in government, to the idea that we need to run the world in a better way. And that what we're doing is basically leading us nowhere. It is not solving the problems that affect us in a, in a, in a fundamental way. And I think that in this scenario, there is a kind of a feedback loop, right? A feedback, an important constructive feedback loop whereby the crisis uh, create a greater awareness on the part of our politicians, our business community, ourselves, you know, that we're not headed in the right direction, we need to change course, we need to be develop uh, much stronger mechanisms of international cooperation. And I think that is where, where I derive my optimism for the future. And I think that that is the more likely scenario. And, and I think that is why uh, uh, I, I gave my, my comments today, the title that I gave them, New Hopes for a Changing World. Thank you so much.